On a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone drops to zero. Although I think we all hope that we'll meet our end peacefully, surrounded by our loved ones, the reality for many people is that this is simply not the case. I really can't emphasize it enough, although the story descriptions in this video are true to the events as they occurred, they are still highly disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. In Michigan, in the city of South Lyon, west of Detroit, there is an industrial tube manufacturer known as the Michigan Seamless Tube Plant. In essence, they create various lengths and sizes of metal tubing and piping. Raw metals and other materials arrive at the factory as cylindrical chunks that are then heated until they are white hot, at which point they are molded and hollowed out. The company also creates custom metal alloys and custom finishes on the metal for different industrial applications. Understandably, the factory has to use a variety of heavy machinery and harsh chemicals in the manufacturing process to create the final products. One such chemical they use in the manufacturing process is sulfuric acid. The combination of sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen creates a colorless, odorless liquid that is highly corrosive to everything from rocks to metal. In everyday life, sulfuric acid is highly unusual, but in industrial manufacturing, the liquid is remarkably common and is used in several different processes from fertilizer to mineral processing. Unfortunately, its prevalence in manufacturing doesn't make it any less dangerous. If you get sulfuric acid on your skin, it will cause severe acidic chemical burns that are not unlike the burns you'd get from heat. And just like getting burnt from heat, the chemical burns are extremely painful. It's destructive to all the tissues in your body and will dissolve your skin, your teeth, your eyes, and even your lungs, and you'll die if you get severe enough exposure. On Saturday, February 9th, 54-year-old Daniel Hill got up for work and drove to his job at the Michigan Seamless 2 plant in South Lyon. He had worked for the company since April of 2017 and had just recently moved close to the factory the previous July. According to neighbors of the Hill family, Daniel and the rest of his family were ecstatic to have moved to the countryside. By all accounts, they were nice, quiet people who were thoroughly enjoying their new area that was home to wildlife like deer and coyotes. Now, it's unclear exactly what transpired at the Michigan Tube Factory that day because details of the events are limited, but it seems as though the factory had a raised walkway of sorts above some large vats where they stored different chemicals for the manufacturing process. At some point during the day, some other workers at the plant noticed a man had fallen in to one of the open vats and was at the side trying to pull himself out. They rushed over to him to try to pull him out, and they would manage to get him out, but not before getting burned from the piping hot liquid in the vat, because that specific vat was kept at 160 Fahrenheit, or 70 degrees Celsius. After pulling him out, they realized it was Daniel and rushed him over to one of the safety showers in the factory to wash off all of the chemicals. At this point, Daniel was still walking and talking, although probably in extreme pain from how hot the liquid was. Paramedics arrived at 12.21 p.m. and rushed him to Ann Arbor University Hospital and spent the next 11 hours providing him with medical attention, but unfortunately, Daniel would pass away later that day. It was determined that Daniel had fallen into a vat of 12% sulfuric acid solution and had burns over 100% of his entire body. So not only was the liquid extremely hot, it was extremely corrosive, ultimately contributing to his death. It's unclear exactly how Daniel fell into the vat or how long he was in the vat before anyone had noticed he had fallen in, but it seems as though he had fallen accidentally and was completely submerged during the initial fall. In an investigation of the incident, the Michigan Seamless 2 plant received fines totaling $93,000 for several safety-related concerns, including zero training for at least 18 workers about hazardous energy sources. Orcas, or killer whales, despite their name, are actually members of the oceanic dolphin family and are the largest member of this group. With no natural predators, orcas are the apex predators of their environment and possess sophisticated hunting techniques due to their intelligence. They are also highly social and form stable family groups that pass unique vocalizations and behaviors across generations. Despite their status as apex predators, in the wild they are not considered a threat to humans and no fatal attack has ever been documented. In captivity, however, due to stress and boredom, orcas have been known to act aggressively towards themselves, their tank mates, and their handlers. In December of 1981, a male orca was born off of the coast of Iceland and was captured two years later in 1983. A year after that, he was transferred to sea land of the Pacific in Victoria, British Columbia, where he was nicknamed Tilikum, or Tilly for short. Tilly would later grow to be the largest orca in captivity ever at 12,500 pounds and 22 and a half feet long. His pectoral fins stretched 7 feet out on either side, and his fluke was 6.5 feet long, although it was collapsed as is typical of orcas in captivity. 
In his first years at Sealand, he lived in a tank with two older female orcas. As a result of their matriarchal social structure, Tilly was abused by the older female whales who acted aggressively towards the young male. It got to the point that staff at Sealand had to remove him from the tank and keep him in a smaller medical pool for protection. On February 20th, 1991, part-time trainer and marine biology student Kelty Byrne was cleaning the area around the tank when she slipped and fell into the pool with the three whales. When she slipped, she managed to grab the edge of the pool, so only half of her body was submerged, but as she tried to pull herself out, one of the whales grabbed her and pulled her under the water. In the wild, orcas can travel up to 100 miles in a single day, all while hunting and socializing at the same time. No matter how big the tank, the environment of captive orcas just can't replicate the stimulation that they would receive in the wild. In addition, the objects that they do receive in their tank are typically toys that they're allowed to play with. And so to the three orcas, Kelty was just a new plaything. The other trainers saw what happened and ran over and threw food into the water to distract them, but the whales continued to grab Kelty. They then tried to throw a lifeguard ring to her, but the whales kept her away from the ring so she wasn't able to grab it. Despite being a competitive swimmer, Kelty was just no match for the orcas. Twice while this was going on, Kelty surfaced and screamed, but the whales continued to pull her back under the water. She would eventually surface a third time about 10 minutes later, but this time she was quiet. Kelty had drowned. This was the first time that anyone had ever been recorded being killed by an orca, in the wild or otherwise. It would take another two hours to recover her body, and when they did, all of her clothes had been stripped off and she was covered in bites and bruises. Tilly was moved to SeaWorld in Orlando, Florida soon after this incident, and Sealand was closed in the year following the death of Kelty. Despite this tragic event, Tilly resumed performing once again after being transferred to SeaWorld and would be without incident until nine years later. On July 6, 1999, just after 7 a.m., a maintenance worker was cleaning around the breeding and research pool that Tilly was being held in and noticed a pair of legs draped over Tilly's back. The maintenance worker climbed upstairs to get a better look and would see that it was a man, he had no clothes, he was blue and discolored, and he had cuts and bruises covering his body. He was wearing swim trunks, but they were torn open at the seam and his genitals had been bitten off. It also seemed as though he had been dead for a few hours because rigor mortis had already set in. Paramedics arrived at 7.30 a.m. and pronounced the man dead, who was later identified as David Duke from the wallet found in his clothing that was found neatly folded by the pool. It was discovered that David had visited SeaWorld the day prior and stayed in the park after dark once it had closed. He then snuck through the park and around security to get to where Tilly was being held. The shows at SeaWorld emphasized the human contact with the orcas, and it's thought that David was under the false assumption that he could just get into the pool with Tilly and recreate the experience he saw at the show. But unfortunately, this incorrect assumption would ultimately cost David his life. Once again, Tilly resumed performing shortly after the incident. Although the deaths were tragic, each occurred during extenuating circumstances that were otherwise out of the ordinary. And so the assumption was that Tilly would not continue to pose a threat to anyone. And this assumption was correct for the most part. Tilly performed for years afterwards without incident. By 2010, Tilly was performing in a show called Dine with Shamu with senior trainer Don Brancho. At the time, Dawn was SeaWorld's poster girl. After graduating from the University of South Carolina with a degree in psychology and animal behavior, Dawn continued to pursue her passion, which was working with animals. She started working with dolphins at Six Flags, New Jersey, and outside of work, she volunteered at a local animal shelter and kept a number of rescued animals at her home. In 1994, she transferred to SeaWorld, where she would go on to perform with the orcas. Dawn was eventually promoted to senior trainer and appeared on various news agencies like NBC to talk about the demands of the job and all the ways she stayed in shape to continue to perform at a high level. She would go into detail about the marathons and cycling and weightlifting that she did for training. All of her work paid off, and the famous Dine with Shamu show with Tilly was the star attraction at SeaWorld. Dine with Shamu featured Tilly performing and eating in a pool while guests ate beside the pool watching the show at a poolside restaurant. On February 24th, 2010, during the end of show routine, Dawn was sitting at the edge of the pool, rubbing Tilly's head. She was lying down on a small platform about a foot into the water, lying face to face with Tilly, when all of a sudden, Tilly grabbed her by the ponytail and pulled her under the water. At least a dozen people watched in horror as Tilly dragged Dawn around under the water and kept her submerged. Other trainers tried to use nets and food to distract Tilly, but nothing was working. For 45 minutes, they followed him around the different sections of the pool, trying to get him to release Don, and eventually they got him into a small medical pool where he let go of the now lifeless body. In the struggle, Tilly had severed her spinal cord, fractured her jaw, ribs, and vertebrae, dislocated her left elbow and knee, and removed her scalp from her head. An autopsy later confirmed that she had died due to drowning and blunt force trauma. 
In the aftermath of the event, SeaWorld was involved in a number of legal battles, but incredibly, Tilly would resume performing on March 30th, 2011. There were a number of new safety precautions put in place to minimize contact with him, and he would continue performing without incident until his death on January 6th, 2017. Controversy surrounding the incident, as well as allegations of animal cruelty from keeping highly intelligent animals in captivity like orcas, ultimately led to SeaWorld's decision in 2016 to end their breeding program. Eventually, their shows will be discontinued altogether when the last of the remaining captive orcas have died. On February 20th, 2003, in West Warwick, Rhode Island, a small concert took place at a local nightclub known as The Station. The headlining performance that night was the band Great White, and when all the other acts finished their sets, Great White got on stage and ready to perform. Someone in the audience was filming that night, and so there is a video of the entire event, but for those of you who are just listening, the video starts facing a dark stage in a crowd of people. You can hear people cheering as they waited for the band to start, and then the guitar comes in. Even more cheers can be heard, and then the pyrotechnics light up with the first big note of the guitar. In behind the band now are two jets of sparks illuminating them from behind. Let's start the clock. The lead singer can be seen dancing and singing as he moves his way back and forth across the stage. Five seconds went by, and then the camera pans to the right side of the stage, and you can see a large jet of flame going from the sparks to the ceiling. Upon panning over, the cameraman immediately starts to move away from the stage through the crowd. There was now smoke visibly filling the room. Ten seconds later, the cameraman was at the edge of the large room, and the band had stopped playing after noticing the fire. The large jet of sparks had ignited the highly flammable acoustic foam on either side of the stage. 20 seconds later, the lead singer can be heard saying, wow, that's not good, as the cameraman made his way down a hallway. The crowd could be heard audibly saying fire, and the slowly moving mass of people was starting to make its way towards the exit. The acoustic foam was actually composed of two layers, one of urethane and one of polyurethane. Burning polyurethane produces a thick black smoke that is composed of carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide gas. Only a few inhales of the smoke will cause a loss of consciousness and death shortly after if the person continues to inhale the smoke. 30 seconds in, the fire alarm was going off and the stage was engulfed in an inferno. The whole crowd was panicking now and moving quickly towards the door. One minute in, the screams around the building started and the black smoke billowed out of the corridor leading to the exit. One woman can be heard screaming, where's my husband, over and over in the panic. The cameraman made it out of the building and the audible screaming seems to be coming from the entire building at once. The cameraman then makes his way around the side of the building and every window of the building was billowing the thick black smoke. At 1 minute and 30 seconds, the cameraman walked around the building to the front entrance and sees a literal pile of people jammed in the doorway of the building. In the panic, most of the crowd had headed towards the front door. It seems as though some people fell on the way out, and as the crowd continued forward, more people fell on top of them until the entire entrance was blocked by a mass of bodies. All that could be seen was their heads, arms, and torso as they struggled to free themselves. At two minutes, the cameraman is panning around the front side of the building, and people can be seen pouring out of the window beside the front entrance as black smoke pours out from behind them. At three minutes, 30 seconds, the cameraman starts to walk around the building again and sees another entrance into what looks like a hallway that is empty but completely engulfed in flame. He yelled into the hallway to see if anyone was nearby, but there was nothing but flames. He continued walking around the building, and as he did, the screams disappeared in the distance and all he heard was the crackling of the fire. At 4 minutes 30 seconds, the camera pans to the roof of the building and there are flames escaping through it. The cameraman then walked back around towards the front of the building and the screams became audible once again. Fire trucks could also be heard in the distance, rapidly approaching. At 6 minutes, the cameraman rounds the building once again and sees that the entrance of the building was now completely engulfed in flames. By 9 minutes, the entire building was an inferno. The video continues for a total of 13 minutes and eventually, all of the screaming stops. Towards the end, the cameraman is filming the building from a distance as he walks through the parked cars in the parking lot. Of the 462 people in attendance that day, 100 people died, 230 were injured, and 132 escaped uninjured. The causes of death of the 100 people that died that day include burns, smoke inhalation, or crushing. Ultimately, the speed at which the fire spread, poor visibility, and the volume of people all moving towards a single exit contributed to the tragic events that occurred that day. However, the main cause of the events that day were the pyrotechnics in a relatively small room with a low ceiling. In the aftermath of the events, the club owners claimed that they didn't give the man permission to use the sparkler jets, 
Well, the band claims that they were given permission. It was also discovered that the station nightclub did not have a sprinkler system, which would have slowed the spread of the fire significantly. Due to the old age of the building and its size, the station nightclub was thought to be exempt from the requirement. It's unclear exactly how it passed fire inspection without this being noticed, but this would be another contributor to the events on that fateful day. The two owners of the club and the band's manager who set up the pyrotechnics were charged with over 200 counts of involuntary manslaughter each and received sentences of varying lengths. Incredibly, the station nightclub fire is only the fourth deadliest nightclub fire in US history. If you made it this far, I just want to thank you for watching. This is part three of the series, A Collection of Horrible Fates. So if you enjoyed this video, you may want to check out the other videos in the series. If you want to support the channel, give this video a like and drop a comment down below. If you're new here, welcome to Scary Interesting. If this is the type of content you enjoy, I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. Once again, thank you so much for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next one.